number 10, holy goose. Yeah. Back in the days of old, there were a lot of people in Europe who felt the need to participate in the Crusades. There was a wide array of reasons as to why an individual would want to join in on this quest, and there were a lot of motivators for people as well. Though many people participated in these conquests by order of whatever ruler sent them on their way, others found different justifications, and one of the leaders for this quest was a goose. A holy goose. In 1096, the People's Crusade, unsanctioned by the Pope, took place and a handful of people went there following a goose that they believed was some kind of divine being. The story here goes that there was a woman who was being trailed by one of her geese and through miscommunication and misunderstanding, some started to believe that this goose was actually leading them, not following them. Today, scholars can't grasp how ridiculous this was for people to actually believe that this bird was leading them on a holy quest, especially since back in those days, people thought that animals didn't have souls and were therefore unable to grasp the concept of divinity anyway. These people were so obsessed with this goose that they even allowed it to enter a church, which was also considered blasphemous at the time. All right, number nine, pickled. Just like the first parts of the Caribbean movie, the first crusade was the only successful one. Well, successful by Christian terms. They killed a lot of innocent people. Legend has it that when the Christians took Jerusalem, the blood in the streets was like a foot deep. It was awful. But of course, the Christians couldn't help but reboot the whole affair. When Saladin took Jerusalem back, this sparked the Third Crusade. One such emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, was a fierce leader, and even though he was 67 years old, Saladin was wary of his arrival. But he never got there. While crossing Turkey, the great leader fell fell off his horse into a river and the weight of his armor caused him to drown. His death dissipated his massive army and some historians believe that should the German emperor have made it, the Third Crusades would have been more successful. But some of Frederick's followers were so loyal and heartbroken at the loss of their ruler that they tried to pickle his body. But it didn't work though and his remains were then like instead interred in several cathedrals on the way home. I number eight, divine intervention. I'm sure you are somewhat familiar with the idea of divine intervention, the notion that some kind of religious or cosmic force intervenes in your life for some kind of purpose. Well, according to some stories, there was allegedly a case of divine intervention during the Crusades that helped them find a religious artifact. In one of the strangest events of the Crusades, a low-ranking French peasant named Peter Bartholomew had Saint Andrew appear before him and he seemingly revealed the location of the Holy Lance, a spear that was quote, believed to be a spear that was used by Roman soldiers to pierce Jesus' side at the crucifixion. Now you can imagine that if this peasant man went up to someone in a higher rank back then and told them that they were visited by a saint and told them where to find the Holy Lands, they would probably be a tad bit skeptical. But they still took a chance on him, and wouldn't you know, they actually found the religious artifact. People were still a little confused as to how Bartholomew knew exactly where to find it, and so a little later on, he tried to prove himself through trial by fire. But as you can imagine, that did not really work out in his favor. He ended up badly burned and passed away shortly after. Uh, number seven, the Crusades, but for kids. So contagious was the idea of the Crusades that they even made a boys and girls club all about it. Different times, folks. Different times. 12 year old Stephen of Cloyes began the pursuit with tens of thousands of children in his wake, ready to fight the holy war. Of course, the King of France and the Pope gave him one look and were like, Nope, go home. But they persisted. Stephen had a divine vision and preached to whomever would listen, and he was really good at promoting hysteria. A similar thing happened in Germany led by a boy named Nicholas of Cologne. They were unarmed and optimistic that they could take back the Holy Land. Though of course both uprisings were absolute failures. The herd of many crusaders got as far as Italy, then language barriers, hunger and exhaustion became too big an obstacle to overcome. Stephen did get an audience with Philip of France, but that was about as far as they got. Some historians wager whether it was this fantastic tale that inspired the story of the Pied Piper. At number six, meteor shower. Before anyone really understood anything about astronomy, people believed that things like meteor showers and eclipses were signs from the gods. This was so heavily believed by the crusaders that it actually had a big influence on their conquests. Back during the 11th century, the crusaders interpreted these big space events as omens. Seeing a meteor or a comet was seen as a good omen and having a lunar eclipse was also interpreted as God endorsing their holy war. He really said, thumbs up guys, go ahead. 
Some were a little more intense with their interpretations and saw these events as signs of the end of the world and this actually sort of lines up with the timeline of some of the crusades. It tied in with the first crusade as after witnessing a meteor shower, Pope Urban II declared a holy war. Some see this as the church's way of claiming as much religious ground as possible before the end times. Speaking of the stars foretelling misfortunes, something weird happened during the Third Crusade. Shortly after Richard arrived towards the end of June, an eclipse plunged the battlefield into darkness. It lasted for three hours and unsettled the Christian crew because of obvious reasons, because Brie mentioned, you know. It also creepily coincided with the nativity of St. John the Baptist and matched up with a wave of illness that swept over. Richard developed a high fever, his hair started falling out, and his teeth and gums became sore and inflamed. Turns out the great king got a fierce bout of scurvy, which after a long ship voyage wasn't uncommon. But for the king to succumb to such terrible sickness right after the ominous event rendered his army nervous. At the time, Richard and Saladin were still in negotiations, which soon turned sour after miscommunications from his envoys. Richard was still ill when the battle began, and his friend, King Philip, decided to attack the Cursed Tower. Richard still joined in, even with his illness. Uh, James Rustin Jr. writes, From the top of the Matt Griffin, he was reclined, like, back in a chair with a crossbow, with, like, its teeth falling out, picking off enemies. At number four, eating grass. As was mentioned before, there were a lot of reasons why people joined the Crusades. Some did it for glory and money, others did it because they were asked to, and others did it for the sake of their beliefs. For those who wanted to join the Crusades solely for their religion, some believed that fighting in these wars was the absolute immersion into their religion and they took it pretty seriously. These people were called the Taffers and they were known for taking the Crusades very, very seriously. They took strict vows of poverty, they wore ragged clothing, got rid of all of their weapons, and they even ate grass and roots to survive. And no, we're not talking about wheat grass shots that you get at Booster Juice. We're talking about barnyard animal grazing energy from these people. These people leaned heavily into filth and destitution for the cause. The Taffers also made a name for themselves thanks to their ruthlessness and plundering in war, even creeping out some of the other crusaders. They were really serious about their cause and it really showed that these people were built different. Speaking of grass, kind of, number three, the origin of assassins. Assassins played a huge role in the Crusades, albeit undercover. Most documentation that exists around these mysterious and skilled assassins comes from the accounts of their enemies. But did you know that the term assassins has a relationship to the term hashish, an extract of cannabis? Neither did I until I started reading about the Crusades. An old man named Sinan led this group of Ismailite assassins and was known to the Christians as the old man of the mountain. Sinan was brilliant, deceitful, mystical, ruthless, and created a league of assassins so powerful, even the mention of their name made both Christian and Muslim sides quiver with fear. But in order to be indoctrinated into the group, the young men ingested a potion laced with cannabis, which transported them to paradise. They would then be handed a dagger and given their assignment. They became known as the Hashashans, which would give rise to the modern term, assassin. And last but not least, Saladin versus Richard. If Richard and Saladin weren't at war with each other, they probably would have been best best friends. When Richard first arrived to the Holy Land and was preparing to take Accra, he was greeted by not arrows, but gifts from Saladin. A basket of pears, Damascian plums, and fruits in a gesture of peace. Richard, curious, sent an envoy to request a meeting in person with the ruler but he refused. Saladin's belief was that should two kings meet, then it was not seemly for them to make war. In between battles and disagreements, the kings would continue to exchange gifts for some reason. For instance, as previously mentioned in another video, Saladin at one time rescued the king. During the Battle of Jaffa, which was I think the last one, King Richard fought so ferociously that Saladin couldn't help but like be mad and pressed. He was like, this guy's such a bad he had lost his horse, but continued to fight tirelessly, killing Saladin's men, and Saladin was like, this guy can't fight on foot. Send him two more horses. Yeah, so the guy in the middle of the battle just sent him two horses because he was like, this guy's amazing. The Third Crusade essentially ended in a stalemate with the two rulers being so well matched, but they never met, even after the fighting was over. Number 10, 
The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like you're already the first man, you don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay. And five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Write that down, except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried in a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, AKA pestilence, AKA the great mortality or simply known as the plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food. Should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who to thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number four, Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, 
England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm uh... I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be, or not to be, 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink cause they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages. Pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. 
Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights in you know, the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was, was no funny business. That was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go. Just show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom. You have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas Day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. 
In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom Oh, the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps. Thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history. Maybe. We're almost there. You'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was, the, that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG, historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. So, in at number 10, we have witch marking. I'm trying to avoid some things we've already covered in similar videos, so while we've discussed witches, let's talk about witch marks. So during the English and Scottish witch hunt days, there was a belief that witches always had a natural skin mark. This could be a mole, or a scar, or a pock mark, or even a 
really bad zit. So when they came across a woman who they thought were a witch, but she didn't have any of those markers, that was the end of it, right? She isn't a witch? Well, no, they gave her a skin mark instead, specifically by using a pricking needle, which the witch hunters would carry. These needles repeatedly pricked the flesh of the accused until it produced the result that wouldn't bleed, but was insensitive to pain, which fulfilled the criteria of a witch's mark. It's a subtle punishment for something that they were yet to be accused of, because by giving them the mark, they could now accuse them. These witch hunt days were a whole mess. Number nine is marking your territory. Not in a cool, sexy, I got a tattoo way, more in a scarlet wetter kind of way. As you'll learn in this video, a woman who cheated or even was single and just engaged in intercourse of her own free will could be classified as a sinful adulterer and cheater and be punished, usually a lot worse than a man. So when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter, he took inspiration from real life events. The letter, which for the character Hester Prynne was just a red A, was usually the letters AD, which stands for adultery, as outlined by the Plymouth Colony Law in 1658. Multiple accounts across Europe verify that someone who has been marked was to be seen out in public without it, could be subject to public whipping and other public humiliations that ensured a person's social alienation. Like in the Scarlet Letter, when Puritan minister Arthur refuses to admit his sinful side of the act with Hester, he's branded with an A in his chest. In a man's case, while this was of course painful, it was allowed to be hidden. He also didn't have to face the societal consequences the way any woman would have. For number 8 we travel to discuss status degradation. While it still persists today, not everyone knows what it means. So essentially you do something wrong, oopsies, you lose some of your basic human rights. You could steal something, have relations out of wedlock, cheat on your partner, miss some work. Every empire that has used this tactic has had a variety of ways that you could mess up and receive this punishment. Naturally, in times where a woman was property and couldn't buy things, own things, or do things, or breathe without having a man side eye her for it, this was a monumental punishment to receive. Under the Roman Empire Augustus, who reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noble women in the Kingdom of Korea during the Chosan Dynasty faced a similar degradation of their societal status if they were found guilty of remarrying as a widow. This intentionally made it hard for Korean women to remarry as they would have nothing to offer a new husband, no inherited lands or funds, and a societal belief deemed her as used goods. Even the descendants of widows at the time who had remarried faced status degradation. They were barred from ever holding office. Adulteresses in the Chosan were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low-born statuses. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high-status women who committed adultery in the Chosan dynasty faced an even graver punishment, which was death. So why take someone's status from them as a criminal punishment? Well, because aside from the fact as a woman you'd essentially be left jobless, homeless, and without any family, it's because of the cheaters fama number seven while fama is a latin term for reputation and good name every country had its own version of this fama and if you cheated or were even just accused of cheating in 13th century france which by the way happened a lot because husbands just want to get rid of their wives the woman was always the center of the punishment even if that was the man who had been cheating this is because the status is all a woman ever had for a very long time and the name of her family's reputation laid on her shoulders thus all that pressure to be religious religious, virtuous, and most importantly, a submissive woman. The customary laws of Agen province list public humiliation for both the wife and her lover as the appropriate punishment for adultery. If the man could escape before or even after arrest, he could get off without any punishment and his partner had to face her punishment alone. The woman got no such reprieve, even if she was just the mistress he cheated on his own wife with. In fact, if she tried to escape arrest, it warranted a death sentence. Women whose fama suffered through public shaming walk of atonement were no longer deemed honorable members of society, and seeing as standing of individuals before law at the time was often based on their reputations, what others thought of them, and how they behaved in public, she'd be left, as I said, homeless, familyless, and dejected. For my Game of Thrones people, think Cersei. Number six is no protection. Get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, there's no protection from capital punishment. While civil laws were easier to work around by just getting married alone, you can borrow money or property, you can buy things that you couldn't before and sign contracts, the criminal law didn't bend to a married woman, as she faced the same penalties as an unmarried one. Now, there are technically one exception, pregnancy. 
but only because it could potentially be a boy, which is insane. Additionally, all women were exempt from certain torts, such as the breaking wheel. But man, when a woman got capital punishment, it was the one and only form, and it was the most brutal and painful one, burning at the stake. By the way, they claim this was the only and the necessary option of execution for a woman, as it's a preservation of female modesty. Apparently, other forms of execution were unbecoming of a woman. Although there may be some truth to this wild justification, modern historians have rounded it down to just misogyny, as well as a deep-rooted suspicion and dislike of women as the root of this execution decision. Essentially, when given the opportunity to punish a woman, men went ham for it and wanted to see her suffer as much as possible. So women experienced the worst executions of the Dark Ages. Number five is why women want to stay in religious favor. In medieval Europe, a device was literally invented for women who defied their religious beliefs. Pyramid shaped and made of wood, the woman who dared to defy her god should fear this. See, they would bind the woman's hands and ankles and then sit one of her two openings on the peak of the pyramid. She would then be incapable of shifting her weight anywhere else and was forced to put her weight down on the tip. It would slowly slide upwards and inwards and the longer she was pressed down on it, the more her body split apart. These women would be left for days on end sometimes on this device. The device's slow agonizing death can be compared only to the shame it inflicted as well. The woman was stripped nude and forced to suffer this torture in public for all to see. Number four is harems. To start, the word harem is derived from the Arabic word word harem, and it often means sacred, forbidden, and sometimes sanctuary. This was an accurate name for, as only women's household members and some related male members were allowed to enter a harem, which was an honored women's space. The harem was the ultimate symbol of a sultan's power. His ownership of women, mostly slaves, was a sign of wealth, power, and sexual prowess. The seclusion from public gaze also inflated this power more so. But a royal harem could be a place of filth and stink where chaos and emotions ran high. High. This was the price of being property. Used by the emperors and his sons, you could either be favored or so hated that one day you vanish and rumors of your exile whirl amongst your peers. These ladies usually did not have the liberty to move out of the harem as they liked, but inside the harem they could move around as they pleased. There was no sisterhood in them either. Socializing amongst themselves was usually not friendly and jealousies were shown directly. Makes sense, as status and position of authority in the harem were determined by the place that they had in the emperor's favor, and to give the king his first male child child was a great competition in this regard, resulted in unpleasantness through the royal harem. Everyone tried their best to please the emperor and turned her bad qualities like jealousy, aggression, or short-tempered attitude onto other women. Seeing as many of these women were stolen from outside the empire, let alone inside, frustration with language barrier and culture clash was also a huge source of contempt. Sometimes the women would lie to the sultan to have others disposed of, or they'd simply gang up on one another. Regardless, harems were places of drama, inequality, and a race to be favored as a ticket out of sexual service. Hidden sexuality is number three. There were plenty of mainstream laws in medieval and middle Europe against male homosexuality, and while it wasn't considered as serious, lesbianism still posed a threat to the ideals of a male-centric societal order. A law written in 1260 France stated that women caught engaging in homosexuality shall undergo mutilation on her first and second offense, and on her third, she must be burned. This is one of the only laws to specify consequences for lesbianism, but the 13th century and Christian perspective of sex radicalized further into modesty. Lesbianism was equated to sodomy at that time point and therefore carried a similar sentence, death. There is sufficient evidence of lesbians in middle ages, most of which come from the church. Turns out many nuns were sexually active lesbians and the church directly acknowledges their presence by having to pass laws establishing penalties for nuns caught having sexual relations with each other. So not only were they having sexual relations with each other, but it was enough that the church had to do something about it. For example, during the 8th century, Pope Gregory III gave penances of 160 days for unnatural female acts. Still, no torture or death though, this is because as long as phallus or other phallus shaped objects weren't used or involved, the relationship wasn't considered real intercourse. Real intercourse involved procreation after all. So eventually, when Christianity upped the ante however, any sexual act that caused pleasure, which now included lesbian intercourse or plain old self-stimulation, was now considered sin. So like most women of the middle ages, even bisexual and lesbian women had to settle down for a man at that point. Anyone who struggled with sexuality can imagine how dreadful it would be to live that way. Divorce was 
was a nightmare, which is why it's number two in our countdown. Laws worldwide were unforgiving of divorces, literally always to the woman. In Chinese laws, a woman could only divorce her husband if he mistreated her family, not even her. He, on the other hand, could divorce her for anything. Some accepted grants for divorce were failure to bear a son, evidence of being unfaithful, lack of piety to the husband's parents, theft, suffering a virulent or infectious disease, jealousy, and talking too much. A pretty superficial list, but in Chinese society, divorce was a serious action with social repercussions for both parties, so consequently divorces were not as common as they may sound. She could not be divorced if she had no family to return to or if she had gone through the three year mourning period for her husband's dead parents. And speaking of family, during the Han Dynasty, unmarried women brought a special tax on their family and women with babies were given a three year exemption from the tax and their husbands a one year, so there was a huge push to get married. Meanwhile in medieval England, their similarities are stark. They too had a small number of divorces despite an expansive list of reasons to do so, such as there was a discovered blood relation between the individuals, or impotence, or fear used to obtain consent, the marriages entered into under false pretenses, things like that. In many of these cases, the lack of sufficient evidence made them difficult to prove and thus deterred people from taking their cases to court. And number one is the tradition of foot binding. It existed for around 10 centuries, and there are women alive today who still have feet that are the result of feet binding. Foot binding involves systematically breaking the feet and shaping them inwards. This tradition started in the Five Dynasties Ten States period of the 10th century, when beloved concubine of the emperor built a gilded lotus flower stage and performed a dance on bound hoof shaped feet. Being a beloved concubine, the other concubines of the emperor attempted to imitate her feet to curry his favor. So foot binding began within the royal court and spread through China as the next fashion fad. It's done in a ritualistic ceremony accompanied by a variety of traditions to ward off any bad luck. They began by tucking the toes under the feet and using a long, tight ribbon wrapped up to the ankle to hold it all in place. Anytime the foot grew, they broke it inwards more, a process usually taking two to three years. The foot would remain bound for the rest of a woman's life. There is a whole list of issues this caused. Outside of extreme agony and being a handicap, it caused some women pain for the rest of their life. Their walk was changed, as was their posture, and the idealism of a slim body to lighten the pressure on one's feet was all the rage. The binding of feet actually caused the women to develop strong muscles in their hips, thighs, and buttocks, so much that the characteristics were considered physically attractive to Chinese men of the area, aka the girlies were thick. When colonization came to China, western women boycotted foot binding, going as far as to catch women with bound feet and cut off their bindings, a humiliation because these women would never ever show their bare feet to anyone, let alone even husbands. And many of these women lost their husbands when the western boycott worked. A lot of girls who had had their feet bound in order to become marriageable, suddenly found themselves abandoned by their husbands because foot binding was no longer fashionable at all. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have heresy. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out. Yeah, I read your comments. Okay, and now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart. Let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders, or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united, single Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number 9. Facial Expressions I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen. Quite frankly, I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that. Which is fine, to be honest with you. I I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. 
The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, Nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen, bald look. Imagine that, imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not, probably not. Macy Williams is just. In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times, it really did work for them. Number seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing, more rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment, well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll ups all night, looking at you, just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the middle ages, you didn't have a fork, no one had forks. If you had a fork, you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you, We'll choke on it because it's all horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well, good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth, worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, 
your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt. It's an old dirty shirt we're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed. You had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes band. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in finding you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. Paul's civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day, after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two, if you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union, just in case. And finally, number one, Pointed shoes. This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long, huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long-toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? 
That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day, yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. Rome really had existed as nothing but a name by the time the empire falls on September 4th of 476, having been falling inwards on itself for just short of a century at that point. So started the periods between the 5th and the 15th centuries known as the Middle Ages. This time can be split into three main sections, the Early Middle Ages, aka the Dark Ages, High Middle Ages, and Late Middle Ages. One of the most famous events from the entirety of the Middle Era was truly kicking in the Dark Ages, and it was the Black Death. Something that nobody gets anymore, with exception for a cool 20,000 some odd people between 2000 and 2009, and 56 people in the United States in the last few years. But if we pretend that we don't know that, and if we can avoid chipmunks like the effing plague carrying hairbringers of death they are, then we most likely don't have to worry. But travel back in time, say, to the 800s or even 1340s Europe, and your chances of surviving are somewhere between 7 and 10 and 2 and 5. Black Death killed as much as 60% of the entire population of Europe. So when you're at work looking around but with those blank dead fish eyes bored, cross off every third person you see in a pattern of five and try to figure out how many of them are gone and who you'd manage without. Probably now being in a position to go, hey boss, looks like you need new middle management team and ain't since nobody left, hooray, promotion. That's exactly what happened in the middle ages too. After half the world died, kind of changed the balance of power. Suddenly peasants could ask for pay raises and improvements and work conditions and life got a little better for them. This was further developed by the evolution of feudalism and as a result the first banks and widespread money supply appeared for the first time in Europe. RIP freedom, hello capitalism. And speaking of the workforce, how about their dirty jobs? Knight, tosher, rat catcher, oh my, there's no shortage of terrible jobs in the dark ages. So let's cover a few. So a leech collector was a woman's role. She was often living in the countryside near marshes and bogs, just generally dirty open water spots where she could strip her legs bare, grab a bucket and wade into the mud, waiting for leeches to sucker themselves on. At that point, she could scrape the buggers off, bucket them, and then sell them in town to physicians, the wealthy people, beauty stores, whatever. Enjoy the scabs and infectious diseases. The groom of the stool was a position for the royal household, who was in charge of cleaning the king's badunkadunk, making sure it was clean and dry post his kingly, well, dumps. Tanning leather seems like it would just be hard. Don't worry, on top of stripping animal skin of its fur, soaking it, and consequently yourself, and lots of lime and salt. It also involved animal feces. See, you'd hire this other guy who somehow had a worse job than you. He's called a pure collector. He'd collect you dog poop, you'd grab it with your bare hands and mush it into leather to treat it. And don't get started on lime burners or treadmill operators, which was essentially a 50-50 death sentence job. And usually whatever job you ended up with was one for life, because chances are you stay in one place. Many people dream of traveling. My generation especially is one that's opting out of children in order to do so. This isn't new, and the human desire to travel and learn is something inherent, coming with curiosity and the need to discover. But this wasn't one of those times. Written records show that a sizable proportion of people not only didn't travel to other countries, they never even left their region or the village they were born in. Even if you did manage to travel, it wasn't planes and annoying but passable airport waits. The average traveler would often sleep out in the open air. Inns or other forms of accommodation were few and far between, and usually too expensive for the typical person to afford. So aside from the super fun chance of freezing to death overnight, Travelers in the Middle Ages also had to worry about being robbed or attacked on the road. Many people therefore chose to travel in groups, but even then you weren't entirely safe. Your homies could turn on you at any second. Consider also that roads and pathways were rough, and this was a ridiculous era where even spraining an ankle could prove to be fatal. Then there's finally bridges, which are quite rare, especially outside of big cities. So you might have to cross rivers manually, and while they could memorize and recite Latin every day, these dummies couldn't swim. Drowning was all too commonplace, even the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I died while attempting to cross a river. So if you're gonna live in one region, one city, and one house your whole life, naturally it would be a dingy shack. 
because peasants' homes were small, often just made up of one room. They were constructed of wattle and daub, a type of method of constructing walls in which vertical wooden stakes or wattles are woven with horizontal twigs and branches and then daubed with clay or mud. Then they'd have a thatched roof to boot. And if they're well constructed, these bad boys could be waterproof and stand for a decent amount of time. But they required upkeep and not everyone can afford that, especially seeing as it's essentially paper mache twigs and mud, you really had to stay on top of this. Inside of a hut, a third of the area was penned off for animals which lived inside with the family. I know people that complain about the smell of a cat litter box. My guy, you could have had a whole donkey living next to the kitchen sink. Chickens, cows, pigs. Then to really complement the mildew smell of rotting roof and the stink of sweat and feces covered animals, a fire burned in the hearth in the center of the hut so that the air was permanently eye watery smoky. Furniture was maybe a couple stools, a trunk and bedding, and a few cooking pots. Beds were a thing, but they weren't very great. And don't forget a couple of dirty chamber pots kicking around the room. We may have discovered a new homing style, you guys. We could call it medieval open conceptualism with minimalism aesthetic. And when it's time to get your kid out of the house, you hook them up with an apprenticeship. The freaky Greekies weren't the only ones tossing their kids at other adults saying, here, take this and raise it. However, unlike the Greek apprenticeship, which came with some strings attached, as explained in the recent top 10 reasons why living in ancient Greece was impossible video, the Dark Age apprenticeship was truly and solely about work. But nobody said it was good or fair work. From the midpoint of the Middle Ages onward, master craftsmen were permitted to employ youngsters for free so long as they provided them with food, lodging, and formal training in their specific craft, which would undoubtedly elevate their status in this society. But getting through an apprenticeship was hard as hell. First, nobody said the food had to be quality, so rations often sucked and apprentices could effectively starve. But then there was the fact you could just get beat up by your master at any time, because it was literally expected of them to do that. Why? Because apprenticeships were ways of parents to get crappy, troublesome teens out of the house and learn some discipline in society. To add insult to injury, apprentices were stuck between childhood and adulthood by being teens. Because on one hand, a teen in medieval times would have been treated as an adult. On the other hand, privileges of adulthood, like the right to inherit money or ownership of land, didn't come into play until around age 21. So you're expected to be an adult, treated like a kid. Small wonder then that the tales of apprentices misbehaving badly are a staple of written accounts from the Middle Ages. Rather than dedicating themselves to their professional development, apprentices would often be found in pubs and brothels. Normal middle aged teen activity. And having a crappy kid sucks even more so back then than now because of the baby gamble. Choosing, if a woman got to choose, to have a baby was a hell of a decision in the dark ages. Plagues, famines, messed up weather, just not the environment for it. Let alone women being regarded as morally weak and they weren't allowed to do things that modern women take for granted, like getting a job, deciding who to marry, having opinions, wearing pants. Your only two options were to become a nun or marriage. No work, no single living in the country, you get two options. And even if you weren't the most devoutedly religious, none was safer, if not a better option. Childbirth and pregnancies would kill one out of every three women in the dark ages. Compare that to today's maternity morality rate as one out of every 0.028% of women. The fact that the female population now is significantly more equal in numbers to men in comparison, I think the choice is spectacularly easy. According to the Raven Report, childbirth in the Middle Ages and the Tudor period were so dangerous, royal women were encouraged to write out their last will and testament well in advance to giving birth. Just imagine adding that to the baby to-do list under decorate nursery and sew onesies. But on the flip side, some men weren't exactly capable of popping out babies, thus the impotence trials. Modern time has counseling, understanding doctors, and little blue pills. All sorts of resources to help men with that issue. But the Middle Ages? Whew, don't expect any real sympathy, not from wives or the whole community. Conjugal duties are taken hella seriously, partially because everyone was frisky and they're locked into having just one person for the rest of their life. And it wasn't just men who had the right to ask their partners to perform. Wives could also demand intimacy and failure to provide, well, buddy, you're getting served. And many recorded cases of women being granted divorce due to their husband's impotency exist to prove it. And they were carried out in public. Whole Judge Judy style throwdowns to called impotency trials where accused man was expected to um, perform in front of the jury. To be granted a divorce, the woman had to prove her man was unable to perform, which wouldn't be shocking when you have an entire village watching with bated breath, even if it wasn't an issue before. Don't worry, a dude could save himself the shame of an annulment by calling on special witnesses such as working girls or other women from the past who could attest his manly prowess. Any medieval lady capable of putting her husband through such a humiliating ritual was almost always from a wealthy family. Lawyers and expert physicians didn't come cheap, but at the end of the day, men were literally able to cut our faces off in public or throw 
person to fire alive for not baking bread right, so guys, I don't really think you can complain about this too much. Laws like this are one of the many stupid details that could have you randomly imprisoned. Another one, stingy stripes. Living in the dark ages is impossible for a lot of reasons, but having to keep track of hundreds of stingy laws to ensure you don't get locked up over a mistake truly was one of the hardest factors. What was the wrong way to pray? The wrong hair? A mole in the wrong spot? A color only the king can wear? Or how the simple act of wearing stripes could lead to your imprisonment or even death? Why? Because for some reason striped clothing were seen as a garment of the devil. Thus anyone caught wearing them would at best get an evil eye from people in the street or at worst get a hemp necktie. From the year 1250 onwards the only people who were caught wearing stripes were the lowest of the low in society. Working girls, handicapped, the ill, the orphaned. They would don striped outfits highlighting their status as outsiders. In 1295 Pope Boniface issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. In the year 1310 in the French town of Rouen, for example, a local cobbler was condemned to death simply because he had been caught wearing striped clothes. Crazily, even animals weren't exempt. Records show that zebras were called beasts of the devil, even though people in Europe had only ever heard reports of them and hadn't even seen one with their own eyes. You can see how these guys led to colonization, right? Ridiculous. With the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe, the hatred of stripes eased and eventually disappeared, and many look on the phenomenon with confusion, and understandably so. Time for the Shrek references, it's ogres and pitchforks. More specifically, just the pitchforks and less specifically, really just the farm tools in general. You guys know in the movies like Shrek when the villagers all come carrying pitchforks and farm tools and of all things, like why that and not swords? First of all, swords are heavy and who has that kicking around? Seriously. Secondly, noblemen could require all male peasants over the age of 18 to report for military service. Didn't matter if it was a justified war against a viable external threat or just a petty fight against a local rival. If you are called up for duty, you had to report. According to histories of the time, around 1 in 5 peasant men would be in a military service. Food and clean water were in short supply and disease was rife. Some historians reckon two thirds of all conscripted men who died were killed by unsanitary conditions of their own camps over any enemy action. But peasants were required to bring their own weapons. Moreover, they would rarely receive anything more than rudimentary training so they're sent to war unprepared and ill-equipped. Thus the thought process, well if this tool works on my farm, for this it'll work for that. So uh, what really sucked about military service in medieval times is how little was in for it for you. These days joining the military can be a way of learning a trade or generally improving your lot in life. Not so back then. Feudal lords were fearful of their peasants getting too powerful. So you're once a farmer, you're staying one. If a peasant soldier got too skillful on the field of battle, there were several cases of them ending up mysteriously dead. It's like getting a journalist of the year award from the CIA. And finally, it wasn't just living that way was impossible, but death sucked too. Alright, so evidently, whether from this video, others, or general universal knowledge, Dark Ages was pretty grim reality to live in. It's short, dirty, desolate, and brutal. But when it wasn't short, it was somehow worse. See, anyone over the age of 50, which was a crazy age achievement at the time, was deemed elderly. Unlike other cultures existing at the time, elderly in Europe are not even close to revered or respected. You didn't get to retire, having to pay your own way and continuing to work until physically you simply couldn't. Then, yeah, after that, you're really just a burden. Your own kids are side eyeing you, and everyone's asking you why haven't you haven't died yet? What's the big hold up here, guys? For many, death was the only real chance to escape from everyday hardships or working the fields and trying to get enough money and food to survive. And when that finally happens and you pass through and rejoin the energies of our earth, you will finally find your peace. Yeah, no, psych, that still didn't happen. According to some research in Europe during the Middle Ages, mass of 40% of graves were disturbed. Now, this wasn't like grave robbing during the enlightenment. There were no university medical schools paying good money for fresh corpses to study. Rather, most cases of grave disturbances were run of the mill theft. Often people would be buried with a small selection of their possessions, perhaps a favorite cup, a locket, a stuffed animal toy, or other such trinkets. In tough times, even some dead person's mystery grave junk might be enough to tempt a broke thief to dig someone up. However, this wasn't always the case. There's some even weirder crap too. Archaeologists in England have found evidence to suggest that in dozens upon dozens of quote grave robbing cases, rather than looking for objects, those responsible bound and gagged the dead bodies and then left them like that. It seems like they're fearful of restless souls or perhaps of the undead rising again. Who knows, they had a lot of problems back then. Steal for number 10. I mean if we're gonna defend Pedro the Cruel, he was obliged to defend his throne against his father's uh, 10 illegitimate sons. On the other hand, they wouldn't have had so much more support from the people than the king himself if Pedro had an outrage 
indigenous people with arbitrary killings, drama, and rules, as well as the pretty cheap treatment of his wife Blanche, the sister of the King of France. His father, Alfonso, had ditched his wife, Pedro's mom, Maria of Portugal, for his mistress once Maria had produced their son. Exiled away from court, Pedro grew up listening to his mother's hatred for his father, yet when he took the throne, he did an almost exact rinse and repeat. Pedro publicly marries Blanche, despite already having secretly wed one of his mistresses, and he abandoned and imprisoned her very shortly after. Basically, if someone looked sideways at him, Pedro had them killed. He inaugurated his reign in 1350 by killing supporters of his half-brothers, and also had his father's mistress killed for his mother. He was said to have killed a man for looking at him wrong way, and burned a woman alive for rejecting his advances. Pedro's new son-in-law, Edward the Black, got blessed with a large gem that he had obtained by robbing and killing a guest in his own house. He also put a hit out on Blanche in the end, and she died via crossbow to the eye. And of course, needless to say, Pedro killed as many of his own half-brothers as he could get his hands on, primarily through various forms of deceit. On to number 9, which is Charles of Navarre, who can also be called the Double Crosser's Double Crosser. See, Charles came from a branch of French royalty that had renounced its claim to the throne, but clearly Charles did not share that sentiment. He is crowned in 1349 and was driven by revenge and a disproportionate sense of entitlement, quickly earning himself the nickname Charles the Bad, as he attempted to expend Navarre's territory into France and Spain via schemes, plot, and deception. Ultimately, he failed and ended up marginalized and alone. In the words of historian Barbara Touchman, Charles was volatile, intelligent, charming, violent, cunning as a fox, ambitious as Lucifer, and more truly than Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. His only constancy was hate. One of Charles's first targets was King Jean II's favorite minister, whom he had killed by thugs. Over the next three decades of the Hundred Year War, as France contested with England for control over territory on the continent, Charles changed sides so quickly and so often that it made everyone's head spin, and making contradictory deals with each side of a conflict at the same time. He attempted one coup and twice tried to poison the king in like a real life Game of Thrones fashion. And trust me, there's a lot of old nobility stories like this one, so if you're interested in hearing more of them, I recommend you take a moment to subscribe to The Hive. Edward III is on our countdown at number 8, and he pulled a total King David. He sent his homie, Earls of Salisbury, to go fight wars in foreign countries so he could go try to bang the Earl's wife on the sly. However, the Countess refused the King's slick idea, but Edward didn't accept that answer and returned after dark. He tells the valets to quote, nothing must interfere with what he was going to do on pain of death. Contemporary accounts from the time, of which there are five parts, detail how the Countess was left in an absolutely horrific state. And by the time her husband returns, she's fallen into a deep depression and admits to her husband what has happened. The Earl goes into a blind rage, understandably, and goes straight to Edward, who was holding court at the time. In front of dozens of witnesses, the Earl confronts his once friend, saying, You have villainously dishonored me and thrown me in the dung, and continues to tell Edward that his actions were so disgusting and inhuman that he could no longer live in the same country with the monstrous king and then just left England forever. As for the Countess Alice, all we know of her her fate is that the Earl made sure she had an independent income and was returned to her family's care before he left. You learn this story young, it's number 7, King John, aka the Magna Carta King, and one of the worst if not the worst King of England. John's offenses are almost too long to list. Even before he was king, the bugger was on some BS. When his older brother Richard the Lionheart was away on a crusade, John attempted to seize the throne by plotting with the King of France, Philip Augustus. Ironically, all those years later, when John is finally king, he starts his reign with the greatest dominion in Europe, England, large parts of Wales and Ireland, also Normandy, Brittany, and Anjou and Aquitaine. Yet within five years, he had lost all, almost all three continental territories to Philip Augustus. This loss of continental inheritance was an embarrassment, and John was determined to win it back. Unfortunately, he was not competent at warfare, and the attempts dragged on and drained the bank accounts. To quote Magna Carta.com, to raise the massive armies and fleet this enterprise would require, he wrung unprecedented sums of money from England. Taxes were suddenly demanded on an almost annual basis. Nobles were charged gargantuan sums to inherit their lands, and the lands of the church were seized, and the Jews were imprisoned and tormented until they agreed to pay extra. John's reign saw the greatest financial exploitation of England since the Norman Conquest. In May of 1215, six months after the French whipped his butt, the people of England rebelled and seized London. With the capital held against him, the kings forced to negotiate and obliged to make concessions. The Magna Carta
Sparta is signed. Then he had it annulled, and then everyone rebelled again, and then John died, and the barons were still rebelling. The end. Next up is William the Conqueror, and he's number six. Before we called him William the Conqueror, he was actually William the Bastard, like something out of a movie. His nobleman father, Robert, came across his tanner mother washing clothes by the river and falls head over heels for her. As a result, the royal heir was not technically royal heir material, but don't let Robert or William hear you say that. Between the two, anyone who ever made fun of William's mother was killed and usually pretty brutally. An example is when the villagers of Alisson hung tanning hides in the trees to mock William's mother's status. William stormed the castle, captured 32 defenders, and had their hands and feet cut off. William, a duke far removed from royal lineage, didn't think too much about England until 1051, when the childless king Edward the Confessor made a truly bizarre decision. He chose William to be his heir. Then, seconds from death, in 1066, he revoked it. William decided, no, I'm getting what I was promised. However, England was in a full-blown crisis of succession for years until William defeated Harold II at the Battles of Hastings and became the new king of England. In wake of his victory, William ordered the harrying of the north. In order for the English population to understand its new state of affairs, he sent his men to the north to kill en masse and pillage stocks. This also made it easier to fulfill his promise of giving the land to his loyal followers. He then imposed new laws, raised taxes, and introduced harsh punishments against those who stepped out of line. The people of England were infuriated by William's new laws, and a series of revolts sprung up north of the country. In response, William and his armies attacked the northern villages, killing everyone in sight as well as the livestock and burning down barns. The lack of livestock led to starvation and disease for what rebels had survived, and the countryside started to reek of corpses. The total death toll, 10,000 people. Up the tower we go for number five. It's Richard III. Richard was never meant to be king, and the malign monarch only landed the job in 1483 because his brother, his brother Edward's children, were deemed too illegitimate for the role. With the support of the Duke of Buckingham, a great campaign promising to improve royal court management, and a stout disapproving of his brother's rampant public adultery, Richard seemed to have potential. But it's kind of hard to praise and look past the two nephews disappearing, however. In August of 1483, the supposed soon-to-be-crowned King Edward and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewbury, were sent to the Tower of London to await Edward's alleged coronation. But his coronation never came, and one day they just disappear. The prince's uncle and would-be king has long since been blamed for their disappearances and probable deaths. He had the most to gain, after all. Richard was also doing everything in his power to prevent the lineage going back to them in the first place, such as planning a marriage between Joanna of Portugal and Manuel, Duke of Beja. When that doesn't work, he tries offering up his niece Elizabeth, who at the time, rumors emerged that Richard was planning to marry himself. The room, This rumor more than possibly drove some to side with Richard's only remaining competition for the throne, Henry Tudor, the same man who defeats and kills Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. On to number four, we have Siva Tapolk the Accursed. Now, damn, that's a heavy name, but it's one well earned. I'll be more than honest, as usual, it's actually quite hard to judge if the medieval nobility of, of Kivian Ru were necessarily good or evil, as we know very little about them, and what we do know is word of mouth stories that survived for centuries before finally being chronicled. So we've all played the kids game telephone, I don't have to tell you how easily word of mouth stories can be converted and contorted. Siva Polk, the son of Vladimir the Grey who baptized Rus to Christianity, certainly had the worst publicity possible documented. He's infamous for the death of his three brothers, Boris Gleb and Svivoslav. Siva Polk's reign was relatively short one, from 1015 to 1019 because brother he hadn't gotten to, Yaroslav the Wise, took action against him. Then Prince of Novogod, Yaroslav defeated his brother, causing him to flee to Poland where his father-in-law was based. With his help, Sivopolk returned to defeat Yaroslav, causing him to flee back to the Novogod. It became a back and forth, taking turns driving each other away, and it was only in 1019 that Yaroslav won. Siva died at age 29, traveling back through Poland. Number three is Christian the Tyrant. His most notorious act was the Stockholm bloodbath of 1520, when after a three-day coronation feast, he beheaded 82 nobles in the Swedish capital after promising them amnesty in return for intel. Up until this point, everything had been going his way. He had reunited the Kalmar Union under his rule, taking control of trade in the Baltic Sea, and married the sister of Charles the Holy Roman Emperor, joining the powerful Habsburg family. But as said by history professor Lars Bittelsgaard, Christian gained a lot of enemies in a very short time at the end of 1520. To quote, the blood Bath was a game changer. Partly it led to a rebellion in Sweden at the time when he didn't have any money left to pay for troops. Partly it was because the Danish nobility began to fear that they would see the same fate and lose 
their heads. In Denmark, Christian II had carried through a modernization program, limiting the power of nobility and strengthening his power as king. And when has the upper class ever liked having their sense of entitlement towards power tampered with? When Sweden started to break loose from the Kalmar Union, the Danish nobility lost patience, forcing Christian from the throne, driving him into exile, and replacing him with his uncle. Not every ruler is ruling over a kingdom. Number two is John and the White Company. John Hawkwood led the White Company Knights Band that tormented the countryside of France, Italy, and Spain in the 14th century. We've done quite a few videos on this channel that explain how knights are kind of like labor or bodyguards for hire when there isn't some war or inquisition going on. Because medieval aristocrats like to disband their armies the moment they no longer need their services. During those times, the men would band up and ride out. As a result, hardened soldiers often found themselves at loose ends and many miles from their homelands. Since medieval armies fed and supplied themselves by pillaging farms and towns as they went, the mercenaries knew that was efficient, free, and easy for them to accomplish. So they continued in this practice. They roamed the countryside, robbing, violating people, and kidnapping random wealthy hostages for ransom. Of course, they were available for hire, but local landowners were more likely to pay them to simply go away. This is also why chivalry was invented, a code of behaviors and rules to govern these knights to stop their overall rampant and sociopathic behavior. Although Hawkwood, who in retirement would set himself up to be a respectable citizen in Florence, was known for his more insatiable greed than his brutality, and thrived in this time as a freelance knight, he was the leader of a band that carried out the Robert Geneva kill order in Sinia. And when two of his men were fighting over who would get to take a nun, he simply pulled a King Solomon and cut her in half. Problem solved. It's last, but that doesn't mean it's the least. Number one is the Vipers of Milan. Bernardo and Galeazzo Visconti jointly ruled Lombardy in what's modern day Italy. And their joint rule really is a testament for how this family really did do everything together. Everything. They succeeded for throne when they killed their older brother by stabbing him and their uncle Lucinio was killed by his wife. A plan she concocted while in the midst of a group intercourse get together on a riverboat. Good thing for her, one of her multiple male partners was Galezio because she could just pop her head up and tell him the plans right then and there. Call that triple tasking. Bernardo, the more ferocious of the two when it came to things that weren't adulterous, such as being in a state of perpetual war with the Pope, who tried to issue a bull of excommunication against him and Bernardo simply responded by forcing the messenger to literally eat it, including the silk cord and the seals of lead that bound it. Bernardo's lusts, by contrast, were unbounded. Has he ever heard the expression about not blaming the messenger? And speaking of Bernardo, watch out Nick Cannon, because while he wasn't a riverboat share sash kind of guy, the dozens upon dozens of illegitimate offspring by his various mistresses outnumbered even the 17 children he somehow fathered with his very long suffering wife. Seriously, check out this guy's wiki page, it's the craziest list I have ever seen. Their most demented action, however, was the Questa Mira together. It's a 40 day torment method handbook that they wrote that would be used and distributed for wide, wide public use usage, and it's the origin of plenty horrific methods that we saw used throughout the times. About all things Harry, and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France is about two princes who were going to ascend to the throne. They were kidnapped, and the queen consort was given the choice, allow her grandson's hair to be cut, or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape, and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern time saying all right kill him instead of a haircut does sound crazy but back then men who had long hair showed their power and wealth according to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn indeed their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further in Germany men also typically wore their hair long but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general, dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair, and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with, while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes, using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place, like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum, however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before for a haircut, in today's world men shave their heads for all sorts of 
reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men, as explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, the more powerful you're supposed to be. So as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment, as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. We talked about one type of head hair, let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. Studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards though is nothing new. During medieval times knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now shaving was common during the middle ages, commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that was kept neat and tidy. Hilariously however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times mirrors were very small and cloudy so they're not reliable, they were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist so if you want to shave you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages, especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly however. The ideal woman in the middle ages had that pale smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many middle age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bath houses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath was time consuming and expensive. So it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating and Christians adopted the same practice. But even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher 
here called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lions or people or mythical creatures. However, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people. So people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cauldron like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, Casey didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh it can remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Meanwhile, in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus, or a gonf stick, as well as a torchicool, or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, while the torchicool was anything to wipe the bottom. Like straw, or moss, or leaves, or wood. You know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags, though, when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag? Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you'd imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside, you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street, as did the live animals in the markets, and so did the people. Also, animals just kind of died in places, and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses, and the smell of diseased human or animal skin, and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly, people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric-like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women would put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays, people use Q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringeworthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tool should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post-medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use, with no bees available, earwax would do. As gross as it may seem to us today, earwax was worth saving and selling. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. 
Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. 
At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. And no, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this, how many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, 
Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Number 10. Pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage rite. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess, if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds. And that was underneath all of your armor. 
No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or, you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage, then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, <sighs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh, many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. 
Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, and he bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our job suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built really, really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Brzezemski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you want to do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmeted cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just 
ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They'd pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they'd glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked. Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to perceive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably, and if you didn't, it was looked down on, but then again, you were also dead, so what does that matter? But it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death, the victim, who was stabbed in the head, always had like a calm expression, which is like, yeah, this is fine. It's a flesh wound. Number seven. A jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow, as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II, for instance, in 1306, had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic. But soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Very name. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far. Off with her head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy, is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades Crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number 5. Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky, and also not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So, because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number four, the mystery of Ludlow Castle. 
Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number three, secret passageways. If I am ever, ever in my life, able to actually afford a house, we'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library, like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it, because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the Postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend, and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corfe Castle during the Siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number 2. Where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos, and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too, and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. Kicking off the list at number 10. Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. 
Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. Onto something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well, and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. They would just leave you hanging by these ropes, and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five. Keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and Everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot. It's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic 
If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat. That's cool, but maybe cover Stuart Little's eyes for this one. Rats as a medieval punishment, where do I even start? Okay, this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time. What was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. At number 10, baby night. I know that when someone asks a little kid what they want to be when they grow up, some of them might respond with saying something like a princess or a cowboy or a knight. But back in the medieval age, kids were really becoming knights, not just when they grew up. Knights started training when they were between the ages of 7 and 10, so their childhoods were pretty short lived. In this day and age, kids that age are starting elementary school and are still too short to ride most rides at the theme park, but back in the day, they were being trained to go off to war. Sounds like a pretty sucky situation but it gets even worse when you realize that most of these young knights didn't even get a choice in the matter. Parents back then controlled what their kids' futures were going to look like, and there was nothing that their kids could do or say about it, so if they were to be trained as a knight and go off to war, that's exactly what was going to happen. At number 9, Squires. Now even though kids as young as 7 years old would be shipped off to train as a knight, luckily no one was going to send these kids out into battle just yet. Before they could even think about seeing the battlefield, they had to go through training. First they started off as pages. The pages mostly did menial tasks like working in the stables and serving food to the knights, but they also learned to ride horses and use a sword. A few years later, when they were about 14 years old, they would graduate to become a squire where they were assigned to a specific knight, sort of like an assistant. The squire would do some pretty menial tasks for their assigned knight and they would clean and polish the knight's armor and sword, tend to the knight's horse and help the knight get into their armor for battle. Most squires got through these tasks with the dream that one day they would become a knight themselves and have a squire of their own, but unfortunately in some cases some squires never became knights and they stayed a squire even past the age of 18 when most squires would become knights. Seems a little unfair to me, but I guess in that case you wouldn't be burdened with the knowledge that you could die on the battlefield since you would never make it there. Before we continue learning about medieval knights and how messed up their lives were, why not consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe also consider smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, training. When you picture what it would look like to see squires training, what do you imagine? Do you picture kids fighting with wooden swords or practicing how to put on armor? Well, you can put that out of your mind because that image is more sunshine and rainbows than what actually went on because training to be a knight was a very grueling process. When a page graduated to become a squire, they then had to master the seven points of agility. The seven points of agility were sort of like sports that would help the squires become good knights. They had to master shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, and tournament sports like jousting and dancing. 
Yes, that is more than seven, but let's just agree that medieval math was flawed and not think about it too hard. Other than the physical skills that they had to master, squires also had to learn how to recite poetry, hunt, play chess, and impress the ladies because even though they were going to be slaying people on the battlefield, they still needed to be able to win a woman's heart. Unfortunately, even with all of this training, many young knights died in their first battles, but at least they tried their best, right? At number seven, too much poop. Here's a real downside to being a knight in the medieval era. While we've been taught that knights were these amazing, brave, chivalrous men that would rescue a princess and live happily ever after, the reality is that they were actually a bunch of dudes on a muddy battlefield with poor hygiene that were literally pooping themselves to death. Many knights who embarked on crusades had a lot of parasites and diseases, and one illness that proved most problematic was dysentery. Dysentery is an illness that basically causes super poops due to a parasite. So these knights were out trying to win back the holy lands while their tum tums were throwing up gang signs getting mad rumbly on the battlefield. It is believed that these knights contracted dysentery through drinking tainted water, and because medicine was basically a myth at this point, once you contracted dysentery, you could basically kiss your life goodbye and your stomach contents goodbye. The most famous case of death by butt explosion was from the Seventh Crusade, where Louis the Ninth had contracted dysentery and had his pants cut because he was tired of having to pull them down every time he felt a rumbly in his tumbly. This all sounds like such a horrible way to go and a serious downside to be being a knight. At number six, armor. We all have a pretty good idea of what knights looked like, right? The shiny metal armor, the chain mail and helmet. Well, as cool as they may have looked, the armor that knights wore was actually pretty impractical when it came to agility because there was just no way you could move very easily when wearing it. These knights had to carry around a lot of weight. Hollywood made us believe that swords that knights used were incredibly heavy, but in reality they only weighed about 3 to 5 pounds. Yeah, they were pretty hefty, but nowhere near the kind of weight that knights were carrying on their bodies because of their armor. The average medieval suit of armor weighed between 45 and 55 pounds, and just the helmet alone weighed 4 to 8 pounds. Knights on the battlefield had to worry about fighting, staying alive, and carrying an extra 45 pounds on them, but knights who jousted had it even worse because their armor was known to weigh twice as much as battle armor. These knights had to be very strong in order to carry that around, otherwise they would have collapsed under the weight of their gear when they got too tired to keep going. At number 5, always in danger. When knights weren't out in some kind of battlefield, they didn't just get to sit around doing nothing waiting for the next battle. They were still knights and people loved them, so they had to entertain people through tournaments. This wasn't your average tournament like when you went to a medieval times as a kid because this was way bloodier and safety was not really much of a priority. It wasn't as dangerous as going off to battle, but there was still a risk that knights had to take and sometimes it ended fatally. Tournaments would normally involve two different events, melee and jousting. We all know what jousting is though, right? It's where two knights on horseback charge at each other with lances trying to knock their opponent off their horse. This sport injured and even killed people in the past. In 1559, the King of France, Henry II, was killed during a jousting tournament because his opponent's lance broke apart and sent splinters into his eyes and brain. These tournaments were meant for fun and games and entertainment, but they often ended in bloodshed in some way, so these knights always had to risk their lives even when they weren't in an active fight. At number four, fired. As with any kind of job, medieval knights could get fired. These days, if you get fired, you just have to find another job to fall back on, but for knights, they had it much, much worse. Knights served their kings, and so if they did anything that went against their monarch, or if they did something that the king didn't like, they could essentially be fired from being a knight, since the king is the one who made them one in the first place. What the king giveth, he could taketh away, pretty much. When a knight was fired, the king would start by hacking off the knight's spurs, then they would break their sword, then they would burn the knight's coat of arms and hang their shield upside down for the entire kingdom to see because these people really liked public humiliation. And if you thought that was enough, just you wait because on top of the spurs and the sword and the shield, they would also execute the knight for good measure. So really, you never ever want to get fired back then because it would really end badly for you. At number three, burial. For medieval knights, dying was just part of the job. When someone became a knight, they knew that this was a risk that they were going to have to take. And for some knights, they worried about where they would be buried because it had to be in the right spot, otherwise they wouldn't go to heaven. When a knight died in battle, their body had to be buried in the right kind of dirt, and that was the consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. To solve this problem for young knights, when they were knighted, they would also be given a burial plot in a church graveyard, so they knew that they were guaranteed a spot in heaven when they died. This, 
however, created a bit of a loophole for anyone wanting to get a one way ticket to heaven because even older knights who enlisted later in life would be able to get buried beneath a stone effigy in a church and be able to go to heaven even if they really never did all that churchy stuff beforehand. At number two, yummy people. As you could probably imagine, for medieval knights, desperate times called for desperate measures. Oftentimes, during battles, supplies would run out and knights would be left dealing with starvation on top of everything else that they were going through. This proved to be a huge problem during the Crusades because after supplies and food started to run out, people got desperate and started seeing other people as snacks if you know what I mean. Some of the poorest crusaders resorted to eating people to get them through their journey to take back the holy lands and as you can imagine, it was a pretty gory sight to see. Knights back then recalled seeing enemy forces on spits and dismembered people just laying around in plain view. It was rough being a knight back then and the amount of shortcuts and strategies people came up with just to survive got real dark real fast. And finally at number one, dehydration. On top of not having enough to eat, many knights from the crusades also didn't have anything to drink and many of them died of dehydration. Dehydration was especially deadly during heat waves. At one point things got so bad for knights embarking on their holy war that 500 knights died of dehydration in just one summer back in 1097. Since it was such a terrible way to go, people started weaponizing dehydration so to speak. This happened when the Sultan Saladin lured the enemy forces away from their water source and set fire to the grass around the enemy troops, causing them to overheat. Because they couldn't drink anything and because of the intense heat, the troops got too weak to fight back and then they were defeated by Saladin. The elements were so intense that these knights really had it bad. Weaponizing dehydration, that is a super messed up thing to do, but back then, people were ruthless. Number 10, Gucci to the Socks. Man of Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is however difficult to place an exact number on his wealth, as this was a very long time ago, and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However, in his travels and hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold, it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, impaled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vlad he did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit and when he asked them to remove their hats as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. The east becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? 
slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria, which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. Number 7. Off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. I could think of some nasty other stuff too. I know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants, especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course, you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with, which funny enough might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also, not to mention his food was fresh, or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? Number 6. The Cowardly Lion Richard I was the king of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades. After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps, which actually was common for the time. Sadly, Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3,000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. Number 5. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. That being said, the family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well-known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which, if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They used money and power to manipulate, and they got their way. Number four, diaper sniper. All right. This one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious, lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in the oldie times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity, but I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Number three, dyslexia for cure found. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10, 
and that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart. They might overthrow you after all. And sorry ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs. No girls allowed. The richest of families could have their son sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. I'm assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? Number 2. Do you require a bowel movement sir? Kings will be kings and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty, or really just a bull, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact. Which, I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh. Number 1. Dead End Job Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaving a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kinda sucks though. Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings of the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing, and because of their social status, a lot of them lived lonely lives. Kicking off the list at number 10, leave. One of the first things you'd want to do if you magically were able to travel back to the Middle Ages is come right back. Yeah, it's not knights in shining armor and drinking unlimited IPAs in a heated cot. It was the Dark Ages. It sucked. More often than not, if you lived through the Middle Ages, you never left your village. Because where would you go? The world is also dark and dangerous. Nothing's built yet. You can't warm up in a coffee shop until your Uber arrives, right? Most travelers just slept outside or under some bushes. Records from that time show that the average person didn't travel in their entire life. The rest of this list should also explain why. Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight savings. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as the <laughs> recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like, Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. It gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. Finish work. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, forget a mask. The plague made a mark on humanity in the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't wear a mask and social distance. When Europeans were hit with the Black Death in 1348, fleas carried by rats were mostly to blame. Around one third of the population was killed and it was easily contracted. One sneeze later and your lungs are filling up with liquid. Life expectancy in the late 14th century was 20 years old because of this thing. There was little to no knowledge about germs or how they were spreading, so you'd be in the middle of a literal plague. There'd be bodies lying everywhere, people were dumping they're due to out windows. They're like, oh, good evening, madam. And then you'd inhale and then. Number seven, get married. Love is in the air. In the dark ages, marriage was difficult to do. This was long before divorce lawyers came around to get every last drop of you. It was so easy that if you loved somebody, you would just announce that now you're married. Chris, we're married now. Isn't that crazy? That's how easy it was, boom. 
No need for a priest, big celebration, paperwork? Who has time for that? Nobody likes that. Sex before marriage, of course, was also a no-no. So if somebody just happened to wander into the wrong chamber and caught you doing the dirty, all you'd have to do is lie on the spot and say that you're married and then be like, get out, weirdo. And they're like, ah, crap, they're married. We'll try again later. But more often than not, witnesses would be asked to be present when this marriage happened because the sad reality is that guys would often go through all this, get in bed, do the <laughs> and then deny ever agreeing to the union in the next town when he's shacking up with somebody else. Horrible. Number six, disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturb the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe you had an argument and got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old ha <laughs> ha, one, two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. So you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a Blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. When the Catholic Church was running the show during the Middle Ages, you better have been part of the God Squad or else you're gonna join them, apparently. Thomas Aquinas wrote about blasphemy in the Middle Ages saying that if we compare murder and blasphemy as regards to the object of those sins, it is clear that blasphemy, which is a sin committed directly against God, is more grave than murder, which is a sin against one's neighbor. On the other hand, if we compare them in respect of the harm wrought by them, murder is the graver sin, for murder does more harm to one's neighbor than blasphemy does to God. Yeah, that's, that's what you gotta deal with if you went back in time. Good, good luck, hope you're religious. If you spoke ill of the church and had beliefs of your own, God forbid, pun intended, that was one of the most wicked crimes to date. If you were charged with blasphemy, your tongue was removed with hot tongs or pliers. Awful. According to the Old Testament, other punishments would include stoning or hanging. All because you just, you said, I don't like him. I don't like that guy that does things. The way he's doing this, I'm hungry and I'm in pain and my family's dead, I don't know. Sorry. Blasphemy was common because you could accidentally do it, unlike stealing, you know? On my way to the studio today, I slipped on some ice, and let me tell you, if I was in the Middle Ages, I would have been charged twice before 9 a.m. Number three, live in the city. Okay, you may grow up wanting to live in the big city, eh? The Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Whatever, whatever pulls you to the city, it would have been a lot different back then. Living in the city sucked. It was actually preferred to live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Like starving was better than this, really. If you were poor in the city, you had a short and nasty life. Cities were often built near rivers, but it didn't take long for said rivers to be full of sewage, stinky water. I mentioned the plague earlier. Just like today, numbers pop in large cities, so if disease hit the town, it hit the town pretty hard just constantly wiping out these packed crowds over and over. And maybe you're a fan of the nightlife. Maybe you wish you were able to hit up these local medieval taverns, have a ye old IPA, ale, whatever the hell. It wasn't even that fun. Curfews were strict, and if you were caught outside of that curfew, the odds of your drunk self getting robbed would be pretty high. Also, cities had public bathhouses too, which sounds nice, but again, during the Black Death, maybe let's not take a dip today. Let's, let's just wait. wait. Let's just wait a week. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. 
That's it. Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Boniface VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool. You can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And finally, number one, witchcraft. Whenever we think back to the Middle Ages, it's hard to forget that we once would accuse others of being a witch. It's like five plus five, I think that's 10. We're like, how did you know that? You're a witch, you're definitely a witch. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and mm, wizardry. No better sous chef than a golden retriever. Just mix it up some potions. To be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so I don't completely disagree on that thought. But cats? What's a cat doing? with a cauldron. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused as well as two dogs. If their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Nothing to do with the poison rye, just all over the floor. It's for sure part-time witch. Villagers believe that witches traveled at night, not by broom, but by riding on the back of your furry friend. And it also wasn't just dogs or cats. They thought witches rode pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. I'd be like, I'm good, I'll beat you there. Even so, if you were convicted of being a witch, you had to confess. If you confessed to being a witch, your life was spared, and, and oddly enough, if you refused to confess, then you were executed. In the meantime though, being a witch and all, your head was being dunked in water, you were sleep deprived, these horrible torture methods were used until you were so broken that eventually you just admit to being a witch. You're like, fine, I, me and Airbud, we witch it up, happy, and then, you're fine. If you were suspected of witchcraft, you also had to get naked in front of all these creeps while they looked for the devil's mark. The devil's mark being a birthmark or a mole or freckle, blemish on the skin, whatever. All signs of making deals with the devil, apparently. This thing would've, I would've gone to jail for sure for this one. I would've been dead for this, that's huge. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time, or farming fran time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it. 
if you will. Which, if you know history, was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France. It was going rather poor, actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five, queen. It is unusual, most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although I certainly like to be, I can't just imagine it. King of the internet, king of the black hoodie, nice, or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserve, and every girl does, queens just had it better, and that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brushed with a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him. He's a chef. He said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God, and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed, staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible, and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks, and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artists. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just, it sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, baby. I, didn't, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? 
Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. At number 10, Roast Hedgehog. Hedgehogs, am I right? They're cute little spiky balls of fun and they make pretty good pets too. They're so cute that you would never want anything bad to happen to them, right? Well, if you lived in the medieval ages, you might beg to differ because while today we see hedgehogs as these lovable little creatures, back then they were nothing but something to feed your family for dinner. Sorry to anyone who owns a hedgehog. Yeah, hedgehogs were a delicacy back then and there's even a record of a common recipe for them. In the olden days when someone was looking to cook up a hedgehog for dinner, you would first have to unalive it and then gut it, tie it up, and wrap it in pastry. Apparently, if your hedgehog wouldn't unroll after it was uh, taken out, so to speak, you would just have to simply boil it in water and continue the preparation process. Apparently, back then, it was believed that eating hedgehogs helped with medical conditions like throat inflammation and leprosy. Not really sure how effective that was, but it was still a thing. At number nine, porpoise pottage. During Lent, people weren't allowed to eat meat. Normally, people would substitute to do fish into their diet during this time, but if you were one of the wealthy, then you could treat yourself to something a little more extravagant than just plain old fish. For those who could afford it, they would sit down to a seafood feast, and they really ate anything that came out of the sea. We're talking fish, lobster, crabs, eels, and dolphins. Yeah, they thought that dolphins were fish and so safe to eat during Lent. In a recipe book from 1399 written by King Richard II's cooks, there was a recipe for porpoise fermentry, which was basically a sweet and spicy wheat porridge with dolphin on top. It consisted of almond milk and saffron and just sounds absolutely vile. I couldn't imagine what a dolphin would even taste like, but I wouldn't imagine that it would taste very good, especially with almond milk, wheat, and saffron. But would you guys try it? Now before I carry on telling you guys about the weird things that people ate in medieval times, I would first like to take a moment to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number eight, garbage. Ever heard of a garbage plate? It's a dish that originated in Rochester, New York, and it is a big plate of things like macaroni salad, baked beans, french fries, and a bunch of other things. Well, in medieval times, they also sort of had their own garbage plate, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound nearly as good as the one from Rochester. Their garbage was pretty foul, and honestly, I don't think that you could pay me enough to sit down and eat this thing. As the name dictates, garbage was made of, well, garbage. Anything that wasn't used in other dishes was basically thrown into a pot, cooked up with some seasonings, hopes, and dreams. Even the recipe sounds gross, dude. In an excerpt from a medieval cookbook to prepare garbage, it says to quote, take good giblets, aka the garbage, chicken heads, feet, livers, gizzards, and wash them all clean. Throw them into a nice pot and add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, and sage chopped small. Then take bread, steep it in the same broth, draw it through a strainer, add and let it boil till done. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which was sour grape or apple juice, salt, and a little saffron, and serve it forth." End quote. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass on that one, thank you. At right, number seven, cock and trice. When living in medieval times, people had to be very creative when it came to cooking. You had to create flavors with limited resources while also trying to dodge the risk of poisoning people if you're not careful, but this next dish pushed the boundaries of culinary art so much that Gordon Ramsay would have to call every chef who made this an idiot sandwich. Back in medieval times, some chefs would prepare a dish called cock and rice, and it was kind of a monstrosity. This imaginative dish was made by combining a pig and a chicken into some kind of revolutionary Frankenstein's monster. Essentially, this dish was made by cooking a pig and a chicken, and then the chef would cut both animals in half and then attach the front half of a pig to the rear half of a chicken. Then it would be stuffed and roasted on a spit, glazed in egg yolks and saffron, and topped with a gold leaf before being served to an elite like a king or queen. There was also an alternative version of this dish where instead of having the two halves of the animal mashed together, it would instead have the chicken riding the pig, and some chefs would even adorn the chicken with a knight's helmet for some extra pizzazz. Not sure why this was invented, but it certainly is creative to say the least. At number six, 
roasted cat. We started off this list talking about one common household pet that was traditionally eaten in medieval times, but now we have another, so for anyone who has a feline friend, you might want to skip this part. Roasted cat was yet another bizarre food that was eaten back in the olden days, and I can't really say I'm all that surprised. I mean, they were eating hedgehogs, dolphins, and garbage, so I wouldn't put it past them to take a bite out of Garfield too. Roasted cat was a pretty straightforward dish. They would just marinate it and roast it like they would any other kind of animal, but what makes this dish strange other than the fact that it's a cat was the way that it was prepared and the superstition behind it. Cats already have a lot of superstition behind them so it makes sense that in medieval times they believed all sorts of things about felines but when it came to cooking them it was believed that cutting the head off before cooking it was a vital step because quote it is not for eating for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment end quote. So yeah don't go eating cat brains I guess. At number five Beavers. Remember a little while ago when I mentioned the medieval practices of Lent and how they ate dolphins because they thought they were fish? Well, we have another animal that is most definitely not a fish, but medieval people believed that it was. Beavers. Yeah, beavers. They thought that because beavers were such good swimmers that they just had to be some kind of fish and were therefore suitable to eat during Lent. Originally, it was just the tail of the beaver that was suitable for Lent because it was considered cold, but later on they figured that the whole animal was good to eat because again, they thought it was a fish. I can't really see how they looked at this furry animal and thought to themselves, ah yes, a fine sea dwelling fish. But hey, these people believed in witches, unicorns, and regularly put animals like pigs and donkeys on trial, so there you go. At number four, singing chicken. Continuing on with another insanely weird food from the medieval age, we have one that was pretty dangerous to eat, though the people who lived back then probably didn't know it was so unsafe. Back then, some chefs would prepare a pretty theatrical dish and called it singing chicken. Man, the things that they did to these poor chickens. Anyways, singing chicken was prepared by taking the chicken's neck and tying it with quicksilver and sulfur, and when the bird was heated, it made a sound like it was singing. Why this was necessary? Who the heck knows? There were other versions of these kinds of theatrical meals as well, where swans, pigs, and even fish were made to look like it was breathing fire. Chefs would soak cotton in alcohol and place it inside the animal, and when it was time to serve, they would light the cotton on fire and make the food look like it was some kind of dragon. At number three, roasted swan. A lot of people see swans as beautiful creatures. I mean, I see them as deceptive geese because even though they are pretty, they will still attack you and eat your young, but I digress. Though swans are a lot of people's favorite animals, in medieval times, swans were more so people's favorite food. Yeah, even the swans weren't safe from being devoured. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, since it's a bird, it's probably prepared in a normal way. And to those people, I say, have you been paying attention at all? Nothing was normal back then, and of course they had to make things weird. There were two ways of preparing a swan. The weird way, and the strange way. The first way of preparing the swan was to mince the entrails of a boiled swan with bread, ginger, and blood, and then mix it with vinegar. Yum. And the second way was to cut the bird open, remove its skin, roast it on a spit, and then reclothe it with its skin and feathers and present it to eager guests. Sounds absolutely horrible. At number two, lamprey. Imagine this, a gross, slithery eel with gray scaly skin and a suction cup-like face full of tiny, sharp teeth. Does that sound tasty to you? Because I can't say it does. However, to people in the medieval age, apparently it was finger licking good because this lamprey was all the rage and was actually a favorite of King Henry I of England who was actually said to have died from eating too many lamprey. Lamprey was considered a delicacy and was often enjoyed with a side of hot sauce. I don't care how it's prepared, you cannot catch me eating a sharp tooth worm of the sea. And finally at number one, live food. I think that by now we understand that medieval cuisine was as much about theatrics as it was about sustenance. Between singing chickens, fire breathing fish, and cockatrices, a lot was happening in the kitchens back then, but by far the weirdest food trend from the medieval age was their live food shows. Because a lot of people loved a good show, chefs came up with a new idea to wow their dinner guests where they would serve an animal that looked to be dead and cooked, only for it to get up and run away when a 
that got to the table. The most common animal used for these theatrics was of course the chicken. To prepare this unorthodox dish, the chef would take the animal, let's use the chicken as an example, and they would pluck it while it was still alive and glaze it to make it look like it had been cooked. They would then wait until the chicken fell asleep in the kitchen and bring it out on a platter. However, just as the chicken was about to be carved up and served, it would wake up and run down the table creating a chaotic dinner. Another common live food that would be served was frog pie. Chefs would put frogs in a pie and then when the top of the pie was cut open, the frogs would jump out and startle the dinner guests. Now how's that for dinner and a show? Yeah.